Welcome to the Edelheit Experience, a compelling conversation about revolutionizing health and well being, bringing you rich stories and lessons learned from leading corporate executives. Now, we'd like to introduce your host, Jonathan Edelheit. Welcome to the Edelheit Experience. This is Jonathan Edelheit. I, my guest today is Laura Putnam. Laura, thank you for joining us. Jonathan, thank you so much for having me. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Laura. How did you get into this whole well-being thing and, and what are you doing? <laughs> and what a ride it's been for all of us, has it not? I am what I, I call myself a former urban public high school teacher, former competitive gymnast, uh, former professional dancer, former uh, public policy worker. I worked on Capitol Hill on the Senate Antitrust Subcommittee a number of years ago, turned movement builder in the world of health and well-being. So I kind of bring my sensibility as an educator to this space, uh, creating powerful learning experiences as a way to transform individuals, teams, and organizations around health and well-being. I just really want to jump into it. So there's this term wellness privilege, you know, tell us where, what does that really mean? Well, I love that it's kind of open-ended and, and most recently I actually had a, a, a wonderful DEI expert and coach, Sasha Thompson on a LinkedIn live interview and, and I asked her, what are, what are your thoughts on what wellness privilege means to you? And she characterized it as being unapologetically able to engage with your well being. So, it, it, very simply, this is a term that I coined in partnership with Karen Catlin, who is a, a DEI expert and author of Better Allies. And it's kind of a coming together of the world of DEI with the world of health and well being. And it's really taking a look at how we in the world of health and well-being have failed to really address the context within which the individual makes their choices around their health and well-being. And we have not paid attention enough to those external factors that relate to the kind of the world of DEI, things like gender, things like race, things like age, things like religion, and that really shape our capacity as individuals to be able to make the healthy choice. So things like uh, get out into nature, which sounds like a well-intended um, tip, that assumes privilege. That uh, specifically, that assumes that the individual has easy access to decent green spaces. And according to the Trust for Public Land, over 100 million Americans don't have that privilege. Or things like, uh, you know, I know that if I, uh, that my voice will be counted in the workplace. I'm rarely interrupted or ignored. That, or I get to come to work as my full authentic self. Those all assume privilege. So we have to call those out and then begin to address those uh, barriers that get in the way of every individual being able to engage with their well-being. I like that analogy, you know, that example you just did of voice, you know, be, be, and the reason why is global healthcare accreditation for business, you know, has this new accreditation for prioritizing health, safety, and well-being. And, and currently the safety definition really has to do with workplace safety, infectious disease, all these things, but it's expanding into this safety in the workplace from like what you just said is my voice. Uh, am I heard? Am I safe? You know, depending on what race, what color, what, you know, how I identify myself with. And I think with this wellness privilege, you're bringing up this, you know, really important thing. Cause I think if we went back five years into corporate wellness, well-being, every, th there weren't many options, and this wouldn't even be entertained. Why do you think we're entertaining this concept now? Like what has changed where it's being realized and people are open to this, this reality? Well, I think that there are a couple of things. One is I think that the pandemic itself and world turned upside down has cracked all of us wide open where we are 
in a place to be able to see things more honestly and more openly in a way that we weren't able to before. And then of course, the murder of George Floyd, that changed everything for all of us. That was an awakening around what systemic racism looks like. And so we know that that, that one event catalyzed different kinds of conversations around DEI and then you couple that with the, the, the pandemic and all that has come with it, um, there has been this awakening around well-being. And so the two have really come together where I think that there is a willingness now for organizations and their leaders to begin to entertain bigger, more systemic questions around the pursuit of well-being that transcends the take personal responsibility for your health and well-being conversation that has been in play for so long. And I think part of that story, right, is that well-being is unique to every individual, where before it was, this is our well-being program, or this is what well-being should be, realizing that not everybody has access to the same well-being options or solutions. And we really have to look at how we either make something available or or customize it. Totally. I mean, I, so let's let's break that down a little bit. So first and foremost, what well being looks like to each of us is different. So I often pose the question, "What does me at my best look like for you?" And I think that Maya Angelou said it best when she said, "My mission in life is not merely to survive." but to fully thrive and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. So everybody gets to choose what me at my best looks like for them. But then part two of that is that we have to call out those currents, if you will, that we're surrounded by as individuals. And for some of us, we are lucky enough to be surrounded by currents that literally push us toward us being able to self-actualize on our version of me at my best. And for others, they are having to swim upstream. And so we can collectively begin to address those currents so that everyone is more enabled to be able to become their better selves as opposed to just a few of us. And so those currents if we, if we break those down, those are things like asking ourselves a question, am I healthier, more enabled to become my best self because of where I live or less so? And do the systems within where I live, do they benefit me or do they work against me? And then dropping down a level, am I enabled to become my best self because of where I work, because of the places that I go or less so? And then dropping down yet another level is, am I enabled to become my best self because of the teams that I'm on and the boss that I work for or less so? So that really starts to highlight some of those barriers that are present for some and not others. So going into the importance of your manager or boss, I, you know, I know, I think there's a um, more of a common sense that people realize. Listen, if if I have a boss who's mean or nasty, you know that's obviously going to affect my well-being. But maybe you know, where do you see the importance in the role of that manager having such a big impact on that employee's well-being, and and how do companies need to really realize that or adjust for that? Well, whether or not well-being is part of a manager's job description the manager has everything to do with the extent to which their team members are well or not. So that's the first piece is that every manager needs to be awakened to a, here's why well-being really matters. Well-being in the workplace has everything to do with the bottom line. It has everything to do with the people and it has everything to do with building a winning team. Now, the second part of that is why you specifically as a manager and I think a lot of managers just aren't aware of the critical role that they play. So for example, according to Gallup, the manager alone likely accounts for up to 70% of the variance of their team members' engagement, both with their work as well as their well-being. And another frightening study, this actually came out of Sweden, the Karolinska Institute found that the manager 
that my, if I'm a, a, an employee, my boss matters more to my heart health than my doctor does. And a, a boss can, a negative boss can actually increase our risk of having a heart attack, not just right now, but for 10 years out. So when we hear people joking about my boss is killing me, they actually kind of mean it. <laughs> So, so I share that with managers, you yeah. know, this isn't meant to scare you, but this is meant to really awaken you to the critical role that you play. And so you have a, a, a choice to make. And that is, are you going to stick your head in the sand and pretend like this wellness and well-being stuff doesn't matter? And then it's just up to the individuals to, to do it themselves, or it's up to HR to create these wellness programs. Or are you going to put on your cape and become that agent of change, that multiplier of well-being for your team. And here's how you can do it. Is that easy to do? You know, because I know a lot of, you have a lot of companies, you know, they're focusing on, you know, almost the corporate level, but how difficult is that to really drill down and get your managers to have that self-awareness and then realize, you know, the impact they have and how they can potentially, you know, change? Well, I think so much of it, of it is how it's positioned. And unfortunately, wellness and well-being is too often positioned as a standalone program that's really perceived as being something that's outside of the day-to-day -day, uh, business as usual. And so one of the first things that needs to happen is that we need to do a better job of incorporating well-being into those initiatives that are considered important. So uh, safety training is certainly a, a, a perfect, what I characterize as a stealth opportunity um, to position uh, well-being, showing the connection between the two, but also incorporating it into those safety trainings. But also leadership training is a perfect place to position well-being, especially if we want to target those managers and leaders. So rather than having that standalone, you know, lunch and learn, for example, where nobody goes except for the low level of employees, um, to instead really start to uh, incorporate well-being into those high profile uh, leadership training programs and, and, and really sh show those managers and leaders just how much well-being is part and parcel with becoming a more effective leader and with building a high performing team. I think that's, that's key. Do, do you think that that's where most companies should focus on now or yeah. should there be? Okay. So yeah. how many, <laughs> how many are doing that? <laughs> you know, I, I, in the, that's the, always the direction that I try to push the organizations that I work with. And, and when I first began uh, developing this, um, what I, the, our program is called Managers on the Move, which originally started out as a single workshop, now expanded into a three-part series. Um, so most recently delivered this workshop as kind of a 15-month program um, to all the managers and leaders at, at Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Dakota. But in its iter original iteration, um, and I should add that was presented as more of a leadership development kind of program. But in its original iteration, in, back in 2014, I was brought in by Schindler Elevator Corporation, specifically by a woman by the name of Julie Shipley. This was originally her idea. And her idea was, hey, we've got this annual uh, leadership training program. It's a two-day offsite. This is for our top line managers, our, our high potential managers. And we want to bring well-being into this leadership training. And so this was a leadership training that was a coveted leadership training, like the, 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 the every manager wanted to be in that training because this, this meant that they were on the track to potentially be part of the executive team in the future. So they all want to be there. You've got this amazing captive audience and one that's not necessarily attuned to well-being. And then, and then we said, hey, here's, here's leadership training and here's how it connects to well-being. So I got to be the one who was brought in as uh, the expert around well-being and collaboratively we d developed and delivered this, um, what at the time was called Leadership Odyssey 
two day offsite. And that has been the foundation for all of my work since around engaging managers as these multipliers of well being now, now called uh, managers on the move. Where do you think a lot of companies go wrong in what they're doing in trying to approach or solve or offer, you know, well being to their employees? Well, I think found, <laughs> fundamentally, and there is this flawed thinking that if you build it as in a wellness program, they, as in the employees that you're trying to reach, they will necess- that they will come. And uh, what the research shows repeatedly, uh, starting with uh, the, the, the RAND study back in 2012, is in that study, they found that over 80% of eligible employees are simply opting out. That hasn't changed that much. I mean, in some cases, there are some exceptions to that. Um, but too often, even when employees are engaging with those programs, it's kind of check the box. Like, you know, sure, I'll take the annual health risk assessment and I collect on my uh, prize money for that. And, um, and then I don't really do much beyond that. So I think that that's the, the first piece. And, and then hand in hand with that is this repeated effort to design and deliver standalone wellness programs which will never really change the needle as opposed to really looking at the larger culture. Is this a culture in which well-being is fundamentally supported or is it one in which it's undermined? So uh, for example, burnout is something that organizations repeatedly try to solve that through standalone wellness programs that teach people how to breathe better, teach them, teaches them to take more yoga classes or be more mindful. But those are paltry in comparison to the larger organizational issues that these programs are not solving. So things like work overload. So no yoga program, for example, is going to make up for an employee having to do the work of three. That is an organizational issue that needs to be solved um, and, and the organization needs to be willing to do the work or an issue like toxicity tolerated in the workplace. That's an organizational issue. Are the organizations and their leaders willing to do the hard work to really uh, uncover those root causes and actually address those? Or are they gonna continue to put the burden on the individual asking them to be quote, more resilient? So you mentioned toxicity. I was talking this earlier this week with one of the first 10 Amazon employees ever. And he said, and he was there, I think five, six years, that in the beginning, it was extremely toxic. Um, And that the, you know, it was a very cutthroat bullying atmosphere. And you look at Amazon today, and it's one of the most successful companies or the most successful company out there. And you have this balance of, I think some people thinking you, you know, you have to be you know, give it your all to make something really succeed. And then you've got this other side saying, hey, if you're not going to succeed if you don't have, you know, a good sense of well-being and your, you know, employees don't have balance and things like that. You know, how, how do we how do we solve that, I guess, the gap between there or or what is the exact right mix that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really looking at performance over the long run as opposed to the short term. And I think that one of the best examples of high performance at all costs and where that can lead is Enron. Look at what happened at Enron. And if Amazon continues to have this churn and burn culture, much the way Enron had, uh, ultimately it's, it's unsustainable. And also it, it does a company really want to stand for that kind of exploitation? Um, even if it leads to short-term benefits, uh, or are companies, uh, willing to really step up to be better than that. And, and I think certainly in the time of what's happening in, in Ukraine right now, for example, we're really seeing companies like BP step up to the plate to, to be better than that, to, uh, to stand for um, higher level values. And so I, I hope that, I, I know that, you know, I think that Amazon has gotten better and there's obviously been a lot of media exposure on this 
kind of um, toxicity tolerated in their company for a long time. And I think that they are taking measures to address that. But I still think that fundamentally, um, there is a culture there of, of exploitation um, that, that needs to be, particularly for their lower level employees. Are they I think going to address that? Yeah, I think the one thing that also potentially has changed the game is the fact that you know, the shortage of workers we have, you know, the great resignation of that, you know, people can go work anywhere that they want, you know, and who do they want to work for? Like I saw like Apple is the only, um, you know, mobile phone or I guess tech company that has, you know, gone ahead and said, we're not selling our phones in um, Russia anymore, where none of the other phone companies have done that, not willing to give up profit. But I'm sure there's a lot of pride from existing employees at Apple for working for that. And I think that you know, future employees are probably think that's the kind of company I want to work for. Absolutely. I mean, those kinds of, you know, sometimes symbolic, sometimes real measures, uh, it can go a long way. And the, the, the great resignation, um, I, it, we might call that the great renegotiation. I got this actually from my good friend, Ryan Piccarella, uh, now with Life Guides, formerly the president of Wellcoa. Um, but this has really created a moment for employees. Employees are now in the driver's seat and the, they get to call the shots more than they have in the past. And employers are being forced to, to pay attention to what matters to those employees. So what matters to them is well-being. What matters to them is that they are seen and that they are appreciated for who they are as human beings, not just for what they do, that they are actually cared for, um, these, and that they actually matter. So uh, organizations are gonna have to, to step up to that or they will not be able to retain and attract top talent, period. How do, how do you determine what companies really are doing it versus talking the talk, right? Whether it's you know the ESG, um, you know, like environment, social responsibility, DEI, you know, you know, I've heard some stats out there that were almost, I forget what they were. It was almost like a majority of companies saying they're doing it or actually not. And they're just doing it because that's what they think people want to hear. And it's a minority, you know, more of a minority growing. Like, how do you filter out? And then how does that affect, I feel like, how does that affect corporate culture well-being? Because if a company is saying they're doing something, it's not like the employees aren't going to know you're not doing it. Yeah, and it's almost worse, isn't it, when a company is has bragging rights uh, around well-being or around DEI, and in fact, um, there's the reality is something that's very, very different. Um, I mean, I think one resource is certainly um, things like Glassdoor, uh, where there's unfiltered um, comments coming from employees around what the experience is actually like um and it, you know certainly when when i'm asked to come into come into organizations and do some digging to kind of see what's actually happening uh it, you know surveys where there's room for employees to make comments those it, those will say a lot i mean for example one organization that i worked with <laughs> Um, they were nice enough to share their survey results um, and in it, it, they had collected some comments and this incidentally was conducted before I began working with them, but they asked the question, you know, do you participate in our wellness programs? And not surprisingly, in line with most of the data that's out there, most said no. And then the follow-up question was, if not, why? And some of the comments were crazy. There were things like, um, I do not want to participate in these wellness programs. This is an organization that's run by an inside group of power grabbers or another one like, I do not want to work out with employees only with friends and family or another one saying too exhausted to be attending. Um, that's all the information that they need to know. And the question is, again, are they going to act on this? Or are they? Are the leaders and managers going to stick their head in the sand and pretend like um, this isn't really happening? Um, and and uh, and so they're not going to address that. Now I've shared with you briefly before about the global healthcare accreditation for business and validating companies prioritizing these three things, you know, and it really also being this great tool to be able to share with employees. How do you? How important do you think programs like that will be in the future? You know, for companies. You know, because I look at things like, you know, 
going forward, saying you're doing something is enough. I feel like best places to work is not really as relevant as it used to be, especially now that we have remote workforce and, you know, hybrid workforces, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's a, essential. I mean, I think that those kinds of tools are so important. Um, I, I would say though, that those, that there there are tools and those tools have been out there for a long time, but um, are the organizations willing to actually pay attention to those? So one of the things that I do when I speak with leaders and managers is I will share the, the broader data. So for example, sharing uh, the data um, from Gallup showing that the top drivers of burnout in the workplace have nothing to do with the individual, everything to do with the organization itself. Some of those things that we already talked about, like work overload and, um, and, and toxicity and perceptions of unfairness. And then I also share with them their data and ask them, you, you know, just it's, so for example, with Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Dakota, you, you know, we had um, conducted a, a, a pre-assessment and found that managers were reporting higher levels of well-being in every single domain of well-being measured, which was physical well-being, emotional well-being, social well-being, financial well-being, uh, career well-being, as well as community well-being, than uh, their employees were. And, and I just simply asked them the question, why? Why? Why are managers and leaders reporting higher levels of well-being in every single domain compared to employees? And what are you going to do about it? Is that what you would call the battle of uh, individualization versus the collectiveness? <laughs> yes. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the mantra in, in wellness has for so long been, uh, you know, it's really simple. If you want to get healthier and happier, just make the healthy choice, take personal responsibility for your health and well-being. And uh, it, it, the, the reality is that this needs to be much more of a collective effort. And those people like managers and leaders who are uniquely positioned um, where, whereby they already have hold influence and sway, uh, they need to be taking an active role. And they can do so by doing it themselves. So acting as a role model, um, I call it, I want to see my boss in spandex phenomenon, or maybe not, but you get the point. Like actually in there making the effort um, in, in all their imp imperfect glory, um, but also talking about it in a way that's authentic. And then finally creating some meaningful systems, both across the organization in terms of policies um, and, and really, you know, uncovering those root causes of poor health and well-being and addressing those in a meaningful way. And then on a team level for every manager to be creating some team-based systems that really start to create a new norm around well-being. Now, as we, as we look at the new norm around well-being, in the past, you know, this isn't politically correct, you know, but I think a lot of people, it was, um, didn't care about mental health in, in, within companies. It was, you know, EAP, you, you know, you just offer an EAP. You don't care if anyone uses it. Utilization is super low. The pandemic really changed all of that and gave this prioritization to mental health. The biggest challenge that I see facing the industry is that there's so many mental health solutions coming into play. And we, I think, you know, one thing we've learned the last years, at least I did personally is, you know, my mental health drives a lot of my happiness and well being, And, you know, whether I eat right, whether I exercise my mood, um, that stress level really, you know, matters. Um, you know, where do you think we are with mental health and where do you think we need to head? Well, well first of all, I think that there finally is a recognition around, how widespread mental health issues really are. This is not just a small group of people who are suffering from mental health issues like depression and anxiety. This is widespread. And, and, and I think that that's really, you know, has that conversation has been growing, um, particularly, you know, starting with the, the losses of Anthony Bourdain and, and Kate Spade in such short order. You know, here are these people who seem to have it all and yet um, they were really suffering. Um, I think that that obviously served as a big wake up call. Um, there's been a precipitous rise in uh, pre pandemic around uh, rates of suicide. But um, the, the, you know, the real issue is, um, are these 
while there's a recognition that uh, mental health is uh, something that many of us are, are, are grappling with. Um, I mean, for example, a study that came out um, in June of 2020, uh, a Boston University study found that rates of depression and anxiety have tripled for Americans since the onset of the pandemic. So obviously the pandemic has added fuel to the fire. So now organizations are saying, okay, yes, we need to do something about this. So that has manifested in the form of, for example, senior leaders showing more vulnerability around their own mental health. That's really important. That's good. That's a, a you know good first step. Also in terms of um, the leaders speaking about the, the offerings that are in place, like EAP. And to your point, uh, you know, no, over 90% of, of large organizations have these employee assistance programs in place, but typically about six to 7% of the population are actually using those programs. But then I, I think that the biggest issue for organizations to really contemplate is, are we going to move beyond what is the typical approach around mental health is, let's identify those individuals who are at risk and connect them with the resources that they need as opposed to really looking at the water itself, if you will, kind of the water that everybody's swimming in when they're at work, whether it's in person or virtual. And are we going to address that, which may in fact be pushing people toward a kind of exacerbating a lot of these mental health issues, or are we going to turn a, a blind eye to those? And that's the piece that I'm really, really focused on, which is uh, let, let's, Yes, we've got lots of resources for the individuals, but we need to move beyond that to really uh, address the larger context itself. I agree with you, and I, I think that uh, just the, you know the, the one positive of the pandemic is just that everyone faced stress, you know, and so you know everyone is more open to talking about it from a leadership perspective, and everyone's more open to. Um, you know, discussing it and offering it and investing more in it. I just hope that it's something that they, you know, we invest in the right things and not the wrong things. And that we, you know, it's, it's, it, it's something that really meets people where they're at and is customized for everyone versus just one turnkey solution, you know, that, that leaves a lot of people left out. We, it, it, totally. And, and, you know, I think it, there need to be programs, but more importantly, there just needs to be authentic destigmatization of uh, conversations around well-being. I mean, it, you know, hand in hand with this statistic about rates of depression tripling, another study came out um, not too long afterwards, um, this one conducted by Paychex, in which they found that over half of employees are afraid to talk about their mental health with their boss. And that's even in this new reality. So um, that's a really bad combination. So it has to be uh, conversations that, that go beyond these programs. And, um, and, and again, that has to be an entirely new way of doing business. And, and as much as we're talking about it, I still think that the, the larger culture is one in the, the old school, uh, you check your emotions when you come to work, whether it's in person or virtual. Uh, I think that that still stands, um, even if organizations are saying uh, something different. Um, so that that that's really the question: Are organizations really going to uh, effectively make this a topic that we can talk about authentically, and um, and also are they going to really address those deeper re root causes? Yeah, and I, and I hope we make that big movement because at the end of the day, I feel like it's so much more of a refreshing place to work, you know, when everyone can just be them, their real selves. And I think that one thing that is just missing from this space is, you know, when you talk to someone else and then you find out maybe they're feeling the same thing or going through the same thing, you realize you're not alone, you know, you're not crazy, um, you know, and, and, and also you can learn a lot from what other people are going through. Um, so uh, I really want to thank you for joining us, Laura. Thank you for your insights and your wisdom. Thank you so much for having me, Jonathan. And thanks for your excellent questions. I think that um, one of the things that I always encourage leaders to think about is 
not feeling like they have to have the right answers, but really more about asking the right questions. And I, I, you know, none of us have the answers here. And the only way we will reach more meaningful solutions is by starting with asking the right questions and then really starting to um, work together to find those meaningful solutions.